We'd like to welcome a new radio station who have joined the Point of View Network, and that's WDBA in Du Bois, Pennsylvania. They're at 107.3 FM, and uh, to Don Schobert and all of the people at WDBA, welcome aboard. They started carrying Point of View September the 12th. Welcome aboard. Speaking of dates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today's program is originating on September the 14th, in case uh, you may be hearing it by tape delay. And uh, Dr. Hilton Sutton is my guest, and we are going to address probably what could be called some confusion over the fact that there were dates set for the rapture of the church, either September the 11th, the 12th, the 13th. It didn't happen and uh, we got to find some answers. Dr. Sutton, are you there? I'm here. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's, let's talk about it. You said on the program last week the rapture would not take place on that date. Uh, uh, as we go along, I want you to give some of those reasons, but uh, there may be a lot of people out there with a lot of confusion today, Hilton. Well, I'm quite sure there are. I base that on mail that is coming into our office as well as many telephone calls from various parts of the nation seems that uh, this false prophecy has certainly stirred up a lot of confusion and also, however, uh, caused a considerable interest among a great many Christians to really find out, well, what does the Scripture say? That may be good. Mm -hmm. You know, in everything, you have to kind of look for some good, but uh, to me, overall, if uh, you say something very definitely is going to happen, you write a book to back it up, and it doesn't happen... Your credibility is zilch, so... Well, according to the Scripture, it indeed is. May I... Uh, I have a number of biblical references I'd like to use today with your permission. Sure. And uh, the first one that I want to call to everyone's attention comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm reading from the New King James Translation, beginning with verse 20. Now, I'm aware of the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Wisnett declares he is not a prophet, but he has usurped the position of the prophet by reason of his prophesying and being very dogmatic about it. Now listen to the scriptures. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now were we under the law, that would be the case. Thank God this is a period of grace and God is merciful. The next verse goes on to say, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And Moses goes on to write, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that thing which the Lord has not spoken, uh, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, mm -hmm. and you shall not be afraid of him. In other words, his credibility is zilch. Pay no further attention to him, whatever. Hilton, uh, let, let's go back a little bit and fill people in who don't know what we're talking about, they sure. don't know anything about it. Can you fill us in as to... Let me do it as briefly it? as possible. Okay. Some months ago, uh, books began to appear. Uh, one was entitled On Borrowed Time. The second one, 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 1988, both authored by Edgar Wisnant of Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, then the radio stations began to carry his broadcast. Audio tapes began to be circulated uh, among the Christian community around the nation in which uh, the man simply stated that he had determined by his mathematical wizardry and uh, attempts to support it with chapter and verse of the word that Jesus had to appear and receive the church during the celebration of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which coincides with the Feast of Trumpets and that uh, his calculations were absolutely correct, and that uh, there was no other time that Jesus could appear for the express purpose of catching the church from the earth unto himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he set the time between the evening of September the 11th and the evening of September the 13th, the celebration of Rosh Hashanah. That time has come and gone. The prophecy has proven to be absolutely false. But a great many members of the clergy either did not know how to handle it or were taken in by it, and consequently 
literally hundreds of thousands of Christians across the nation were moved emotionally by it to the point that some did indeed do some rather strange things. I was, uh, I was in Nashville, Tennessee for a, a meeting a few days ago, and on the front page of the newspaper it talked about uh, people having rapture parties. And uh, since then, uh, since the program that we did together, we've gotten reports of some very strange things that, are, that people are doing. This program usually doesn't deal with so-called uh, Bible doctrinal issues as such, but uh, this kind of a thing has some consequences in what people will do. We've got reports of people who've taken their children out of school, uh, closed out bank accounts uh, uh, in preparation for this thing to happen. We even got one kind of far-out report of a man who said uh, if he took his children out of school, drew his, drew his money out of the bank, made preparations, and said if the rapture didn't take place, he was going to commit suicide. Now, I can't see that that is a good effect of, of an erroneous prophecy. Well, let's say this. The Scripture declares that God is not the author of confusion. And since this has caused so much confusion among the saints of God, I think it needs to be absolutely identified as the work of a spirit of confusion that has not proceeded from God, but has proceeded from Satan with the desired intent to disturb the body of Christ as much as he possibly could and possibly cause them to say, well, the next time anyone says something about Jesus is coming soon, mm -hmm. I will pay no attention at all. It's sort of like the, the old story of Hollowing Wolf. And yet when we study the scriptures, it is explicitly clear within God's word that there is such an event. It is highly visible and prophesied by the scriptures that there will come a glorious appearing of Jesus for the express purpose of receiving unto himself, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, 27, a glorious church. I, I think that Satan is doing his best in this hour to trouble, upset, confuse uh, the saints, and if, uh, if possible, to cause them to uh, back off. Uh, I believe that he's going to discover he's made a mistake, and the saints of God are going to... Uh, uh, come to uh, their right standing based on the authority of the Word of God and give Satan more than he's due. I really do expect that. Hilton, uh, a lot of people, of course, read the book, uh, became very enthusiastic about uh, what they thought was going to be the date of the event. Uh, it did not happen. Uh, it's not my purpose to sit here and say, hey, we told you so. That's not the point at all. I think the point is we're going to have to deal with this confusion that you're talking about, and that's the purpose of our conversation today. So what do people do who bought into this? Well, I think the first thing that people are going to have to do is to determine that the Holy Scripture is absolutely the bottom line, and that we must judge all prophetic statements by the authority of the Scripture and that one is to take no action uh, based on the emotion that may be in it. He is to take no action on a prophetic statement until it is properly judged in relationship to the Scripture. Now, if it doesn't edify and comfort and exhort, then it doesn't proceed from God. This particular prophecy was erroneous from the very beginning. Jesus very clearly states in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, that no one may know the day nor the hour in which he is going to appear for the express purpose of receiving the church from the earth unto himself. Let me take a break here. Hilton Sutton, my guest, will come back and take some calls right after this. My guest today, Dr. Hilton Sutton, and we're talking about uh, the recent prophecy concerning the rapture of the church, which was to take place between the 11th and 13th of September. Hilton, uh, in uh, the book that I've got in front of me, the gentleman says, man can now know every event of the end time to the very second except for the day and hour of the rapture. That's the only mystery in the whole thing. Isn't that just like God? He said day and hour. He didn't say week, month, and year. You don't add to God's Word. You don't subtract from God's Word. Now, I'm a very practical man, 
And uh, one of our staff people during the break said to me, I have heard at least 10 times in the last 24 hours ridicule of Christians because of this prophecy. Now, we don't need this, so we're going to have to talk to people about setting dates and buying into anybody that sets dates. It's been happening for hundreds of years, and when are Christians going to wake up? Well, let's look at it from a biblical viewpoint and draw some, I believe, sound conclusions. In this passage of Scripture, where Jesus himself is speaking, in Mark 13, 32, and 33, I want to read it all to you. It says, But of the day and hour no man knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Father, but only nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse thirty three, they never address. No one that's setting a date ever addresses verse thirty three. I'm holding in my hand a book that came in the mail during the course of this, uh, entitled The Day and Hour Jesus Will Return by Colin Deal. And I have read this book. Oh, goodness, some uh, time ago. It was first printed in 1981. Fourth printing was in March of 1986. And uh, he is doing the same thing that, that Edgar Wisnant has done. It is as unsound as Edgar Wisnant's works have proven to be. And they all refuse to give any consideration to this verse, which says, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Now, the word time that Jesus used here is speaking of a broad season, not allowing one to set day, hour, week, month, mm -hmm. or year. Mm -hmm. Reading from the Living Translation, we find that it says, uh, this is uh, the Living Bible, it says, and since you don't know when it will happen, stay alert, be on the watch for my return. Now, that's what that many of us have preached for uh, decades. And the scripture teaches us to be ready and to stay ready. Now, one doesn't uh, wait until there comes an emotional event such as the one we have just come through and decide, hey, I, you know, I'm not living right, I'm not serving God, I'm a sinner, I'm way off base, I think I better get my act together with God because just maybe this thing may be correct. Scriptures teach us to be ready and to stay ready. You know, the Apostle Paul in the early church, uh, they really got these scriptures firsthand, and they practiced them and acted upon them. And if we do anything less than that, then we really can't say that we are biblical people. And one gets ready by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's the first step. But that isn't the last step. And I think it's about time that folks wake up to the reality of the teachings of the Scripture. One has to be born again. Number two, one is going to have to accept the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've got two magnificent references. There are many more. I, I would not attempt uh, on a radio broadcast to go into an exhaustive study. But in Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 14, Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Well, the Spirit of God is not going to take us out of the soundness of God's Word. So if we're led by the Holy Spirit, then uh, uh, we're going to be following in the directions that God te God's textbook provides for us because that's the only textbook the Holy Spirit is going to use. So we've not only got to be born again, which gets us ready, but we've got to have a daily relationship and walk with our Lord under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in order to maintain that ready condition. Now, the Apostle Peter addresses this as well in Second Peter chapter 3, uh, picking it up with verse 17. But you, therefore, beloved, so he's speaking to the church, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our ready condition involves our growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a daily work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and with us. And, of course, we have numerous statements in the New Testament that we are to study the Word. And our problem is, is that 
it's very apparent that there are many Christians today who really have not made a study of the Word. Uh, they're depending totally upon uh, uh, the clergy of their church to do all of their studying for them. And they simply do not know what the Scriptures say. So they are easily preyed upon by a sensational uh, thing such as the one we have just come through. It's a uh, it has really opened the door for God's men to really get into the Holy Scriptures and go into their pulpits and teach and preach the Word of God uh, without compromise. And uh, we are going to have to bring the believing community into spiritual growth and maturity. Now, I've gotten some letters from some dear folks saying, well, the church will never be mature, it will never grow up, it will always have spots and blemishes, and uh, their reasoning is extremely negative and sometimes based upon a negative presentation of theology. I find that when I read and study the Word of God, God doesn't have any problem saying what He means, and He always says it in a very positive manner. And when I read the Apostle Paul's writings in first, uh, the fourth chapter of Ephesians, I start with verse 11. I come down uh, uh, through that, the remainder of that chapter, and I find in verse 14, Paul saying, and I want all of these dear folks that think that they'll never have spiritual maturity, they'll never be able to get their act together with other believers, that they're always going to have spots and blemishes. I want them to listen to what the Apostle Paul has written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. And if what has just happened is not a sterling example of this, then I cannot find a better example in all of God's Word. All right, let's, uh, let's take some calls. If you have opinions on this, uh, let's get it out. Let's air it. Give you a chance to express yourself. Dr. Hilton Sutton is my guest, and we'll go to Tampa, Florida. Hi, Russell. Uh, hi, Martin. You know, I uh, had an opportunity to uh, listen to a tape uh, of John Edgar Wisman that John Barella made on his program, Revival and You. And then I had a chance to hear him on television, and then I had a chance to talk with him on the phone, telephone. And each time he made a statement, which is all I need to realize that this man is, is doesn't know what he's talking about. He said that all living saints, plus those who had passed on, both the unrighteous and the righteous saints would receive their glorified bodies and go to be with the Lord. Uh, then Jesus would separate the righteous saints from the unrighteous saints, and he would send the unrighteous saints to hell, and they would be the first humans to go there. Now, anyone making a statement as stupid as that cannot, could not possibly have any lucidity of, of thought at all. All right, thank you. Hilton, any comment? Well, the man made a, a considerable number of statements uh, that were as off, to, off the wall as the one that uh, the brother just pointed out. I, I wish that uh, we could say that people really listened, and while listening, uh, that they were, would check things out against the written Word of God and not just uh, allow themselves to be so emotionally caught up in something that, uh, man, they, they have happened to them exactly what I read a few moments ago from Ephesians chapter 4. They, they're tossed about by winds of doctrine, and they have been deceived by one who was deceived. Uh, we need to be praying for this, brother, and we need to be praying for those that have allowed this deception uh, to uh, overcome them. Uh, it's just been a lot of it, and deception does not proceed from our Heavenly Father. Laura in Stockton, California. Hello. Yes, hello, Marlon. Hello, Hi. Dr. Sutton. I really enjoyed the show that um, Dr. Sutton had with you about a week or two ago and uh, the comment he said about um, Christians needing to go to the Word. That's, you know, if something doesn't line up with the Word, and I'm afraid that a lot of people went off on sort of a wind of doctrine with this thing, and we do need to, re we do need to pray for them and Edgar, Edgar but... In the, Stockton, in the San Francisco Chronicle six weeks ago, they had an article about him and this prophecy of the rapture. False prophecy, I might add. And um, it um, discussed how all these Christians are going out and selling their homes and running up their credit cards. And 
that just broke my heart to read that and to, to think of the reproach that um, has been brought to the name of our Lord because of that from the unbelievers. And in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul exhort us not to be shaken in mind or troubled, Amen. neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from uh, sin, that the day of Christ is at hand. And then he goes on to say, let no man deceive you by any means. By any means. They shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And the Lord really used these two scriptures to minister to me, not to be shaken or troubled because of that day, and to let um, no man deceive us. So my prayers are going to be for Edgar during these next few weeks, and the people that were deceived by this false prophecy. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Hilton, uh, is uh, Rosh Hashanah over? Yes. It what? officially ended at uh, sundown on uh, the evening of the uh, uh, 13th. Which made it about... That, was, uh, uh, that meant that it officially ended here in uh, our time in Texas, Central Standard Time, at 10 a.m. All right, let me take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> My guest is Dr. Hilton Sutton. He'll answer your questions about uh, this prophecy, uh, which uh, didn't take place. And if you'd like to talk to him, it's 1-800-351-1212. Let me go back, uh, Hilton. Uh, the prophecy was tied into Rosh Hashanah. This is a Jewish uh, holiday. I'm not a celebration up... of the New Year. All right, now you've done a great study of uh, Jewish traditions. You've been to Israel dozens of times, so... Explain to us what Rosh Hashanah is, when it was, and when it ended. All right. Josh, Rosh Hashanah began on, at sundown on the 11th of September and uh, officially ended at sundown on the 13th. The day in which the emphasis is placed upon it was the day of the 12th. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, amazing as it may seem, there was a prophecy ministry based uh, in... Uh, Arizona, I thought I had it right here close by, that uh, came right out and declared that uh, the Lord would appear on uh, the 12th of September, and he even went through all the time zones and laid it out as to what time in each zone that would happen on the 12th of September. Now, mm -hmm. that particular prophecy based in Arizona, uh, excuse me, Las Vegas, Nevada, I'm sorry, uh, is absolutely without credibility as well. Those that subscribe to uh, that particular prophetic ministry should stop their support until they get themselves corrected by the Word of God. And uh, this is a celebration that the Jewish people uh, uh, involve themselves with every year. And uh, it's a very lovely occasion for them. Uh, but for you and I, the Christians, uh, to use these uh, uh, Jewish feast days and celebrations and try to make them support uh, our Christian beliefs uh, is really making a mistake. And I think we see that now in what has happened. Uh, we are aware of the Jewish feast and the importance of those feasts to them. And we do know that there were a number of Jewish feasts that occurred at very significant events in the life of Jesus Christ. But I see this as God's marvelous way of focusing attention on Jesus for the Jewish community. And uh, not for us, then, to have to say we've got to base... Uh, our New Testament teachings and our New Testament beliefs on uh, Old Testament feast days and uh, times of celebration. The man in his calculations just simply was misled. He was misled by a spirit of deceit, and he has deceived a great many people. It's tragic. I, I have uh, had a great many letters. We have a, a large file of letters that have come in from people who just say, I, I have uh, had a great many letters. We have a, oh, a large file of letters that have come in from people who just say, uh, help me, uh, mm -hmm. what is the truth? What can yeah. you say? And yeah. so we certainly answered them all. We had an equal number of letters that uh, were saying, thank God that you were bold enough to say something about it before it happened. Before. Anybody can say, well, mm -hmm. I was against it after it's already happened and proven yeah. to be uh, mistaken. But uh, so many have said, thank God for you and Marlon Maddox that were bold enough to address it before it happened. Uh, we've had a few letters that have, uh, you know, they were filled with uh, um, almost hate because that we would dare to address it. I have, I have a letter in front of me from a 
very dear a child of God who says that the elders of our church picked up on this thing, believed it thoroughly, spent four Wednesday nights teaching it in the church. It has all but destroyed the church. Attendance mm -hmm. has dropped to less than half. Some of the new Christians are saying, I'm so confused. I don't know what I'm going to do or who I can believe. And uh, I'm certain that if there is one church that's experienced this, there's a great many others that have experienced it. And that's but, the reason we're addressing it today. Yes. That confusion. Confusion. And mm -hmm. yet I have a letter here from a very wonderful pastor up in Maryland, and he, he simply points out the fact that he appreciated the boldness and the forthrightness with which that we address this thing and putting it in its proper uh, mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. But uh, he makes some statements in his letter that uh, I think uh, we're, going to, we're going to have to confront. And uh, he says, I, I wonder how many believers are going to be controlled by such a fake spirituality, even when the Holy Spirit witnesses against it in their inner man. He said, because of a lack of boldness to address false spiritualists, and set the matter straight, many will be deceived. But truth, not like this, but truth will outlive a lie. I wonder how Mr. Wiseman will explain the presence of the church on September the 14th. He said uh, uh, in another part of his letter, I certainly wanted to get this point out. Oh, here it is. He said, I fear, now let me back up one more sentence. He said, I have been shocked by the gullibility of some people and embarrassed over the evangelism on false pretense. Mm -hmm. That has to be underlined. Mm -hmm. Embarrassed over the evangelism on false pretense. I fear that these false evangelizers will cause a credibility gap to the true message of repentance and restoration. And those of us that have been in the ministry for many years, both as evangelists and pastors, uh, we can remember the days in which the message of hell, fire, and brimstone was so strong uh, that it frightened people into the altar. The only problem was, when their fear wore off, you didn't see them in church again until the next fellow that came along and preached hell hot and eternity long, and back in the altar they were again. So you've Are got... really being born again? I think not. Just simply an emotional reaction. Simply an emotional reaction, and now they mm -hmm. are saying... Thousands of people have come back to Jesus over an emotional reaction through fear. I want you to know that isn't biblically sound. And unless the saints of God that are mature can get a hold of those folks and let them see what has happened to them and prayerfully hang on to them and keep them in and get them uh, truly converted, then within just a matter of days, if not already, coming to discover that what they were stirred up about has proven to be absolutely false, uh, they'll go back out. And these that help propagate this thing will have made those folks a twofold child of hell. Someone is going to have to answer to God for having done this. In Annapolis, Maryland. Hello, John. Uh, how are you doing, Marlin? Fine. And Dr. Sutton. I am glad that I am not in Mr. Wisenut's camp at this day. I wonder, have you heard anything out of his camp? And then I have one or two short questions after that. Has there been any... No, out of his no, camp. no. I had a newspaper in the state of Missouri call earlier today uh, to get, as they said, the other side of the corn, but they informed me that they're picking up on reports, and whether or not this is true, only the Lord knows, but they're picking up on, the, on reports that some are saying uh, that the date is already being changed. I don't know that. I'll simply say this. If, if uh, the dear brother, Mr. Wisenut, is a, a sincere and honest a Christian as he wants us all to believe that he is. Now, you, are you saying that uh, already we're shifting the dates around? Say we made That's what I'm being told. Now, I can't prove yeah. that. I, I, I only have the word of the newspaper for it. Yeah. Uh, but if the man is, the, is a sincere, honest Christian, he will just come right straight out and say, Folks, I'm sorry. I was deceived. I made a mistake. Please forgive me, and you can be sure I'll not do it again. If that isn't the case, then he and those that are determined to follow him will begin to come up with various adjustments by which they are going to do their best to justify what they have done. You had a Time alone will tell. You had a question? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sutton, my wife and I received this book. Uh, I'm a pastor on the eastern shore of Maryland. We received this book about two months ago, and for just a day or two, uh, we were kind of in that what if stage, and then all of a sudden it began to dawn on me the realization of how this could really uh, turn against it. So I put it down and tried to forget it. 
uh, with the hopes that all of the ministering brethren uh, in our fellowship would also do the same. Unfortunately, this thing has caused a great you know, emotional upheaval across all denominations. I know. And uh, I was able to ignore it only up until uh, Wednesday night a week ago, and I believe it might have been on Marlon's program. Someone said uh, all of a sudden pastors are waking up to the fact that more people in their congregation know about it than yeah. what they may think. So I asked for hands Wednesday night a week ago, and I would say 90% of the congregation heard of it, and I hadn't even spoke to it yet. So I did speak on it. And I try to take a, a middle of a road, but to let them know that I was absolutely biased to not taking it totally to heart. I didn't want them to think that it was such a joke that we could never uh, be in expectancy uh, for the rapture. So I believe that we have, as a church have come to it pretty well. I'm going to speak to it tonight one more time just to uh, remind them of the dangers uh, that could be there if there is a little bit of letdown. I don't want them to think that. Indeed not. You know, I don't want them to get lax or to feel that the rapture could uh, never happen. Uh, this could be a time uh, when they could possibly entertain thoughts of my Lord delayeth his coming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, I'm going to have to run, John. That's a good point, uh, Hilton. Just before the break, uh, I've got an ar article that comes out of the Arkansas Gazette. It's an interview about it. Here's a couple paragraphs. It says, in response to questions Monday, Wizenut talked openly about being treated for mental illness, which he said resulted from a 42-day unrelieved duty watch while in the Navy. Yes, I take medicine for mental illness, but I can function just as well as the next person, he said. He said NASA continued to employ him, although he was treated in a mental hospital for 10 days every two years. I was an effective employee and had valuable information, he said. I'm not trying to hide anything about my illness, he said. Uh, I don't know what bearing this would have on it, but uh, it does. You, what, what do you think about it? Well, I listened got about 20 to seconds. a radio interview that was done in uh, Sarasota, Florida, and uh, in which he did not try to dodge the fact that... Ten seconds, Hilda. Yes that he has indeed been a, has suffered a mental breakdown, that he did have a medical discharge. It does provide him psychiatric care and medication. Dr. Hilton Sutton is my guest, and uh, we're going to take five minutes out for news and information, and then we'll talk some more. This is the USA Radio Network. And Dr. Hilton Sutton is my guest this afternoon. If you'd like to talk to him, the number is 1-800-351-1212, all across America. Hilton, this prophecy that didn't come through has got to be one of the most divisive things that's come down the pike in a long time. It is absolutely the work of the spirit of deception. Satan has, ha has had a heyday with it. It has not proceeded from God. And I say that without any compromise, without any reservation, it has not proceeded from God. During the course of this broadcast, I have had information by long distance from an impeccable source, a researcher, one who really stays on top of things, and the man has set Thursday as the day now. That's the and 15th. if it doesn't happen then, he has declared, he will determine another day later in the year. Uh, they're already in the process of justifying what they have done. They have no desire, apparently, to admit their mistake, and their mistake is absolutely evident. All of the people who have fallen for this thing should fall on their knees and ask God to deliver them from the deception. Those that have books should either immediately trash them or take them back to the bookstore where they got them and ask for their money back, and if they won't give it to them, just drop it on the floor and walk out. All of the bookstores should gather up the books and mail them back to the World Bible Society and demand uh, uh, their money back. If they can't get it, at least uh, they have spoken very strongly against this sort of thing. This is uh, uh, one of the most severe attacks of Satan on the body of Christ of anything that has happened, including some recent tragic events. Okay, let's go to Miwok Village, Wisconsin. Hi, Greg. Uh, it's Miwok Village, California, Marlon. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, I really appreciated uh, what Dr. Sutton had to say earlier about the church preparing itself for the return of our Lord. Uh, 
Of course, the word says that he's going to return for a bride that's without spot and wrinkle. The word says, and I believe it's going to come to pass. Do too. Um, in in the, the book of Matthew, when it talks about uh, some of the scriptures that relate to the rapture, talking about some that are taken and some that are left, it compares it to as in the days of Noah. And it specifically says that those that were taken in the days of Noah, those that were taken in the flood were the wicked. They were the ones destroyed in the flood. And those that were left and remained on the earth were, of course, the righteous, Noah and his family. Um, throughout the Bible, in the Psalms and the Proverbs, throughout the Bible, it talks about the righteous remaining on the earth, inheriting the earth, and that the wicked are those that are cut off and rooted out of the earth. Okay, uh, I'm to make. okay, okay I'll get to yeah, the point. Yeah, make the point real quick. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that the whole doctrine of the rapture is in fact a false doctrine. Oh no indeed, I'm sorry brother, you've listened to some teachers that absolutely do not know the scripture, they're misusing the scripture, taking scripture out of context. Will you listen to Noah and his family were taken out of Give the destruction. Lot and his family were taken out of the destruction if you're going to use Old Testament references. And you can't get by the New Testament statements that the church is to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The church has to go to heaven. That's where the wedding of the Lamb takes place. That's where the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. I'm sorry. You need to divorce yourself from the teaching that is a touch and a hold upon you because it is incorrect. (laughs) Not not both talk at the same time. Uh, Greg, let me let you make a point, and then I'll have uh, Doc Sutton respond. Okay. Make, make a, not a long speech, but make a point, and then I'll have him respond. One quick point in Revelation. All right. God refers to his people becoming kings and priests, which will rule and reign with him on the earth. And so I'll leave it at that. Now, is that uh, okay? With that this? is a true biblical statement, but, you know, we don't just run around and grab a verse of Scripture from this book and another verse from that chapter and a partial verse out of another reference. One must build what they believe is to be the truth on the whole of the Word of God. And when one studies the book of Revelation, those that are making that statement of ruling and reigning with Christ on the earth are making it from a position in heaven, and they do return with Christ from heaven to reign here on the earth. All right, let's uh, let's go to Houston, Texas. Hi, Richard. Uh, hi there, Marlon. Really appreciate what y'all are doing with the show and informing people about this. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, Richard, I thought dealing with social issues and abortion and politics was, uh, uh, you know, get people worked up. Nothing like Bible doctrine to get people right. worked up. Go, I know. go ahead, Richard. We at my church, I'm Metropolitan Baptist, Dr. Kurt Dodd, and Hilton, I believe you know him. Very well. Yes, uh, it hasn't been decisive in our church. In fact, a couple of weeks ago he preached about the second coming, and he did have a lot of comments about the book and used some of your uh, comments as well. And it would, instead of being very divisive, he was showing the misconceptions and the deceptions in there. We had over 30 decisions for Christ that day. It was a glorious service and very good. One thing I was calling about, I, you were talking earlier about uh, some possible changing of the dates in the Houston Post today in the editorial section. There is an article that says, Author revises prediction says rapture will be today. According to Diane MacArthur, general manager of a Christian radio station, KAY in Little Rock, she interviewed him on Monday and says that he was reminded by Bible teachings that the rapture will not occur until the last trumpet blast on earth signaling the end of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Wisenot figures the last trumpet blast will occur along the international date line, and as best he he can calculate, it looks like 9.55 a.m. on Wednesday. So he is already getting pretty desperate to change. Well, if he predicted it to change to 9.55 a.m. today, you see, we're way past that also. The man is way off the wall, and he's going to continue to do this. Everyone should immediately withdraw from him and whoever wants to remain uh, at his side. It's a false operation, uh, an operation of great deception. And the body of Christ cannot afford to entertain any of this. Now, wait a minute, let me... You folks out at Metropolitan Baptist in Houston have a great pastor. I have great respect for him. I believe that he's a man of spiritual discernment, and I thank God for his preaching the Word of God. So, as the Scripture says, it's the goodness of God that bringeth men to repentance, not fear. Now, Richard, uh, let me get this straight. Uh, Today is Wednesday, September the 14th. So the prophecy was changed from the 13th and said it would have happened this morning at 9.30? At 9.55 a.m. Wednesday, that's what it says in this article. That's, yes. Okay, that's today, right? Right. Uh, okay. That's past two. That's over two. Phil Campbell, Alabama. Sherry, hi. Hello, Marlon. I'm, I'm glad I got through. Good I to have you. I to you a lot. 
I've got a couple of questions. I may seem a little silly, but I just can't understand this man. Um, I would like to know how a, a truly born-again Christian could even start to accept, you know, what this man has said about the rapture. And how can he say that he's a Christian and uh, mislead people? You know, in the way that he's doing. Yeah, you know, uh, Sherry, my my approach from this, I really would rather not get into the personality. I don't want to attack a man. I basically I simply want to discuss uh, what what the, the prophecy was, what the book said. As I say, I'm a simple, practical man. There was a statement, a book written, says that a certain event is going to happen September 11th, 12th, or 13th. It didn't happen from a journalist standpoint. Uh, I simply say the guy missed the point. I now hear that he's set another date, which has already passed. That's twice. He's missed it. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at this not as uh, not an attack on somebody. I don't know the guy. But, uh, you know, I, I think people ought to be truthful. They ought to be honest. They ought to be rational. Christianity is a rational religion. Christians should be rational. And when something like this takes place, it makes us look worse than some of the things that have happened with the TV evangelist. Do you agree, Hilton? Yes, I do. I certainly do. In fact, I was guest on a radio talk show that if I had really known the nature of the show uh, on a uh, night before last, if I would really known the nature of the show in advance, I would have declined being guest. But mm -hmm. after I got on it, I saw it was designed uh, as it's a secular station, secular broadcast. I an didn't ambush. know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was designed to be uh, extremely... Uh, uh, used to make mockery of this whole thing. Let me take a break. Hilton Sutton is my guest. We'll be back in about two minutes and take some more calls. Stay with us. And we're back. Larry in Tuttle, Oklahoma. Hi. Yes, sir. I, uh, I'm i pastor of our church, and seeing the uproar that the book called, caused, I felt compelled to address it from the pulpit last Sunday night and condemn the false prophecy. But I concluded the remarks with a verse of scripture that I want to relay from Galatians chapter 6. Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And I want to encourage somebody out there that's a friend or family of Wizenet or uh, the World Bible Society, which all the the uh, the address that they put in their little book that they published for him was just they bought it completely that they go with uh the encouragement of galatians 6 1 and uh try to build this guy back up i placed myself in his shoes this morning and uh he has got to feel just as terrible as anybody ever has and he needs to be uh, comforted and restored as a part of the body and maybe it's a person of uh, international respectability like brother hilton that could go to him and and have uh, have the respectability that it would take to really gain a hearing would you sit down and talk with him hilton sure i would let me tell you that his dearest friends in little rock arkansas have called me they pled with him not to do this they did everything in their power to prevent him from doing this he is driven by a force. That's their terminology. There is, is I, I, it apparently begins to be more of a need uh, of his getting delivered from a seducing spirit as well as finding restoration within the body. And uh, there are marvelous believers in the Little Rock area, and I've talked with any number of them. I think that any of them would be delighted to pray with him and counsel with him. I have talked to some who have attempted to do so. And up to this point, he has refused. He's, he's very humble, he's very kind, but he absolutely refuses. All right, in Columbus, Georgia. Hi, David. How you doing? Uh, I've just got two real short sure. statements, and then I'm going to hang up and listen. All right. Uh, I think you know, I'm listening to a lot of people react out of anger over what's going on here. And I think what we need to remember is it sounded to me like the man was well-meaning but mistaken. So we just need to forgive him and continue to pray for him. Well, you know, this uh, this reason I said what I did, I, I don't know how people feel and some things brought up. Uh, to, to me, I'm not even addressing the man. I, I'm addressing the particular prophecy from a journalistic standpoint, uh, a date that was set, a date that didn't happen. So 
Uh, I really would rather keep the conversation on that level, uh, let the author of it, uh, you know, find his own way. That's not, and I'm not being cruel, but that's not the purpose of the program today, David. Uh, the other uh, comment I had was the uh, same thing that I told several people a few months ago when the uh, publicity about the evangelist was coming out, is I think the only people who are really being hurt by this are the people who were putting their faith in the man who wrote the book or the man who did whatever he, whatever is he did. Okay, thank you. Ramona in Jackson, Mississippi, hi. Yes, hello, Marlon. Hi there. And Dr. Sutton. I just wanted to share with you what happened to me about this. Okay. I had reservations about placing a date for the rapture, but last week it seemed to me that the Holy Spirit was leading me to study the prophecy scriptures and refresh my own knowledge on them. I prayed diligently for lost, for lost family and friends and asked the Lord to point out sin in my own life that I needed to confess and to purify my life. And it's been a wonderful time of revival in my soul, and I wanted to really continue to wait and watch and work for Jesus' return for the church. And whether it be morning, noon, evening, or midnight, today, tomorrow, or whenever, I just wanted to encourage people to just keep looking for his return and, uh, and not let it <laughs> be something that had caused them to not keep looking for him. That's a good word. I thank you for sharing. Let's add to that uh, good statement that if people are really ready and are looking for his appearing, then they're going to be about the master's business. He said in Luke 19, 13, occupy till I come. And it's time that believers get on the cutting edge of what God wants done today instead of just, you know, in a sense of the word, sitting around the idle, uh, going to church on Sunday morning only, participating when it's convenient or they feel like it. It's time for the body of Christ to be aroused, get into the word of God, suit up with the armor of God, take up the weapons that are mighty through God, and get into the cutting edge of what God is doing. I think Satan needs a good shellacking for what he has done. Joanne in Hampshire, Tennessee. Hi, Joanne. Hello. I want to say God bless you for having this program on today. I just hope it helps someone out there that maybe be a little confused that they may go to the Word of God to find their answers. Mm -hmm. I've got two scriptures I would like to read about talking about the last times and when the rapture of the church is supposed to take place. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away from their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And right now this is happening. Uh, America does not have morals anymore, and people just... If you really want to know the truth about the Lord, get into the Word of God and read and study your Bible and don't listen to all these false preachers and teachers that are out here this day and time setting dates and predicting that certain events will happen because nobody knows the day or the hour. We just got to live our lives day to day and not worry about tomorrow because we don't know if tomorrow will even be here or not. Thank you, Joe. That's, that's a good word. Sure is. Hilton, uh, you wrote a book on Revelation. You offered it uh, one time on the program. Do you set a date in that book? Oh, indeed. All right. Tell us about it. You might want to offer it.